she's in New York, Susan. Hi, I think. Just joined us. Thank you. Um, can you unmute yourself? Yes. Uh, Hi. Great. Thank you so much for joining us. You're welcome. Uh, we'll start now. I'll just introduce you, then I'll hand over to you. So we are delighted tonight to welcome Professor Smada Rosenzweig from New York. Uh, so he'll be speaking to us on From the Depths of Anguish to Redemption, The Power of Passionate Prayer in Tanakh. Professor Rosenzweig is a clinical associate professor of Bible and Judaic studies at Stone College for Women, Yeshiva University. She's a world-renowned Jewish educator and lecturer in Tanakh. She received her BA from Barnard College in History and her MA and MPhil from Columbia University in Jewish History, where she was a presidential fellow. Previously, she was professor of Judaic That's Studies at there. Lander College for Women at Turo College yeah. and a lecturer at Allegro, Allegra Franco School of Educational Leadership. She was supposed to be joining us in person in Shul yesterday, and we're sorry we couldn't welcome you. We're delighted to welcome you via Zoom. Um, you're friendly with um, Robertson Zobin, who first mentioned us to you, and then you were coming courtesy, thanks to United Synagogue um, for an event in Manchester today, which also sadly couldn't happen. Um, dedication of the Shir, Shir is dedicated to Mishmat Ruhama Bat Eliyahu Shlomo Zichrona Levracha, the mother of Geraldine Fainer, whose yard site is the 18th of Sivan. I hand over to Professor Rosenzweig now. Thank you very much. Hi, it's really a pleasure to uh, be here today. It would have been uh, lovelier to be with you over Shabbat and to be in Manchester today giving a shi'ur in person, but HaKadosh Baruch Hu had other plans, not just for us, but for the entire uh, world. And so interesting. We discussed this topic already before anything was going on. And we picked this topic of tefillah. I think now this idea of tefillah is so much more meaningful to us after what we've all been going on over the past few months. And my topic today is from the depths of our hearts, the power of passionate prayer in Tanakh. And I think for us, it's so important. What does tefillah mean to us? And how could we learn from everybody in Tanakh? Now we can't go through everyone, but how could we learn from Tanakh how to be people who really connect with the Kurdish Baruch Hu, who really are davening in a way that we really feel that our tefillot are reaching HaKadosh Baruch Hu. One of the biggest issues that we have is we're so small and Hashem is so great. How do we bridge that gap of this big chasm between us and HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And I would like to discuss first Hannah because I think she's one of the greatest examples of how do you bridge that unbelievable divide between man, Anochi Afar Ve'efer, really, I'm not anybody, I'm just one person in this world, is Hashem really looking and listening at me, to me? And on the other hand, Bishvili Nivraha Olam, the whole world was created for me and Hashem is listening to what I have to say. And I think Chada is a great example of that. I want to thank Susan Pasco, Naomi Landy, for really making all of these arrangements. I also want to thank uh, Michelle Baumfreund, who is from the Chief Rabbi's office, who was instrumental originally in this whole uh, connection. So. Let's go, I sent out the sources, so those who want to look in the Mekorot and the sources can. Was it connect, was it really sent, was it sent to everybody? Excellent. So you all have the sources and we're going to um, follow the sources generally for this Sheur. We know that the Avot, Avraham really started Shacharit, Yitzchak started Mincha, and Yaakov started Ma'ariv. They're the ones who instituted these tefillot. But the details of what you say in Shemona Esrei and how we say Shemona Esrei and the passion that we have in tefillah, really Chana is our archetype. She is the one who really teaches us all these details and really sets the stage for what tefillah is. And I think for us, it's so important and such a great model. Here is a woman in Tanakh who does not have any children, 
who is not really someone who we hear her voice right away. We just hear her crying and her anguish. And yet she is able to slowly but surely make this unbelievable connection with our Kaddish Baruch Hu and daven in a way that we don't see those words and those ideas before in Tanakh for individuals on the grand scale. If you look at source number one, now starting in Shmuel, there's a man Elkna, and he's married to two women. And the assumption is, all the Mepharshim explain, that because Khan was barren, he also married Penina. And Penina had many children, and Khan is the main barren. And the man's name is Elkna. And he would go to the Mishan, to Shiloh, in order to sacrifice and to bow down in Shiloh. And they would come every year, and every year Khan would be upset because Pania was given food from the Korbanot for all of her children, and for Chana, Elkanah was only able to give her one portion that was beautiful, or one portion that was double. If you look at him, it says, Mana Achadachayim. He gave her one pasuk, hey, five. He gave her one piece, either it was beautiful or a double portion, maybe two pieces, because he loved Hannah and he wanted her to be happy. Now he was trying to solve the problem by giving her a gift, and we know gifts make you happy, and gifts put a smile on your face, and you know that the person cares about you. So this was. Elkanah's way of saying, oh, I care about you. I love you. Don't worry that you don't have children. I still love you and care about you. A very similar vibe that we have in Tanakh earlier. And Pina tries to get Hana upset every time. And what Hana does is vatifke velotochal. She cries and she doesn't eat which means in the beginning we see that every single year Hannah is passive. passive. She cries and she doesn't eat. And it happens, every year this scenario would repeat itself. And the Malbim explains very interestingly that why would they go? One of the reasons was to daven for children Chilo, at the place where Hashem is, the epicenter, where the mission was. And yet year after year, Nothing happens, and the stereo repeats itself. This is not one time in your life. This is something that happens every single year, and it repeats itself. So we understand the anguish that Hannah is in. It's not like what happens once and oh, she's upset from something that's superficial. It happens all the time. And finally, Elkanah looked at her and we're in. Pasuk 8, source B. And says, Lama Lam Why are you crying? Why won't you eat? Why is your heart from the source, from the root word Ra? Why are you so bitter and angry? I am better to you. Aren't I better to you than 10 sons? And he's trying to say, Penina has sons, but I treat you wonderfully. But our healthy sons will treat you much better. And again, Malba explains, sons are to take care of you when you're older. And they're kind of saying, I will take care of you. You don't need children. You have me. The moment he says this, Rav Soloveitchik explains, Khan realized that she's all alone. Even though we understood the red earl and explained earlier that the mom says they went to Gilo to die for children, Elkana gives up by the time they're doing this over and over again. At that moment, I don't know, Hannah was relying on Elkanah. He's the great leader of the community. He mentioned, we all know if you're married to a ball, it's his villa to Davin. We all go to Tzaddikim, Davin for us. Same thing we had in Sefer Breshit with Rachel. Rachel screams to Yaakov, give me children, otherwise I'm going to die. And the Ramban explains that what did she, real, she have to realize? Rachel had to realize that she had to Davin for herself. She had to take personal responsibility. And at that moment, the Ra explains Rasulichik that she 
felt all alone. And she realized that she would have to do this by herself. Just like Rachel earlier had to dive in to Hashem, and Hashem remembered her when she had a child, so Tuchana would now have to do this on her own. She would have to move from taking this passive crying mode to really stepping up and doing something. And right after Elkanah says this to her, Pasuk Tet, verse 9, Vatakom Chana Achare Ochla Beshilo Vachre Shato. She eats, she drinks, she gets up. And what happens? She all of a sudden is becoming proactive. She realizes if she doesn't do it, no one will. So she gets up and she eats and she drinks. And what does it say about her? Pasuk Yud, 10. She's marat nefesh. She's very bitter. Vatit palel al Hashem She digs down deep. This bitterness originally, which made her inactive, passive, now galvanizes her. We all know this feeling from COVID-19, from the coronavirus right now. I see that we have such an interesting idea. Many times we can be paralyzed by sickness, by death all around us. I don't know how it was in London in the Jewish community. I've read um, here in New York, especially in our Queens community, we had many people who were very ill and unfortunately many people who passed away. And in the bigger New York community, and you know, everyone knows someone, everyone was connected to someone. What's happening is that that can either be debilitating and can paralyze you, or finally you realize that you have to do something. And what Hannah teaches us that even if you feel so desperate, you have to do something. You have to make that effort. And you can even crawl out of that hole and realize that my tefillot, my actions can do something. We saw this with Hagar. We're very disappointed in Hagar. How are we disappointed in Hagar? Hagar, when Yishmael becomes sick, she throws him under the bushes. And she says, Allah Rebbe Motayelet, I don't want to see the child die. She's already assuming that just because they don't have water and he's ill, that he's going to die. It doesn't say that she cries out to Hashem. Hashem hears the voice of Yishmael. In times of desperation and in difficulty, we have to cry out to Hashem. We have to daven and realize no matter how difficult it is, we have to put ourselves out and reach out to Hashem. So even though she was bitter, she davens al Hashem ubachotivke. She cries. Now the language is double here. Ubachotivke. She cries a lot. We have this phrase in Eicha when it talks about Yerushalayim. Bachotivke Yerushalayim. We have that double language only when it's very, very intense. So Chana is feeling in a very intense, bitter mode. And she swears, vatidor neder. It could say vatidor, but she swears. And she says, Hashem imra otire. If you're going to see, and again, double language, in my anguish, remember me and don't forget me. Just like Rachel asked Hashem, vayizkere Hashem, Hashem remembers her. Chana asked to be remembered. Remember me. And then please give me a whole bunch of children. And then right away she says, I'm going to give him to Hashem. That's unbelievable. First she's so bitter and she cries out to Hashem, remember me. And then she asks for this child. And right after she asks for this child, she says, I'm going to give him back to Hashem. Almost like an Akedah idea. She's davening for this child. And then she's willing right away to give him to Hashem. We'll see that she understands that it's a gift from Hashem. And she is so desperate that she is willing to pour her heart out and want to have this child in this most unbelievable way. It is very moving. We read this on Rosh Hashanah as the Haftorah because that's the way we have to start the year. We have to start with this kind of tefillah, this kind of pouring our heart out to Hashem, this kind of connection. Because on the one hand, on Rosh Hashanah, we crown Hashem, Malchuyot. We announce Shofarot, Zichronot. We remember everything Hashem did for us. So we could feel that Hashem is so far away. He's so great. How could we dive in and ask for all these things? And yet, no. 
Hashem is our king and our personal king, and he remembers us. And when we blow the shofar, we're announcing he's the God of all of Am Yisrael, but also our personal God, Hashkacha Pratit. And that's what's so special about our relationship with the Kodesh Baruch Hu, that Chana really shows. When she's davening, she's davening a lot and pouring her heart out. And again, the word we're in C now. She says, Lifne Hashem. Vatit palel, right? Lehit palel, Lifne Hashem. She is davening before Hashem. She feels I'm right in front of Hashem. Sometimes we're so distracted. We have things next to us. We have other things. Things are going on. Hannah, at this point, it's just her and Akkadish Baruch Hu. It shows us in the Psukim that Ailey is sitting right there, but she doesn't even notice him. It's her and Akkadish Baruch Hu. And that's how tefillah should be. During the time, again, now of coronavirus, we all had this opportunity of being alone at home, just us and HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and having that unbelievable ability to just connect directly with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And we have to take that with us after we're still more public and do these other things. Us and HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And Chana is speaking on her heart and her mouth is moving, but she's making no voice, no sound. Now you have to understand early on when you brought a korban, you put your hands on the korban and you said a vidui over the korban. You did smicha on the korban and you said a vidui on the korban. What's happening now? What's happening now is that we see that Chana is doing something new and different. Instead of screaming out her tefillah or saying it out loud so the Kohen and others could hear, She's saying it quietly, just between her and HaKadosh Baruch Hu. This connection of her and HaKadosh Baruch Hu is really such an important message for us. This really solidifies this idea of tefillah. It's you and HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Da lifnei mi ta'omed. Know before who you stand. It's just you and HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And Ailey thinks she's drunk because what is she doing? But no voice is coming. No sound is coming. That was unusual. So he thinks she's drunk. And he asks her, are you drunk? And she says, no, I am bitter. And I'm pouring out my heart to Hashem. Another important element of tefillah is pouring out your heart. It's about pouring out your heart to Hashem. This realization of what Hashem is and what is our connection with him. And Eli notices this and he promises her that Hashem is going to give her what she davened for. Even though she's not saying a word, Ailey understands what is her tefillah. He knows that she's barren, but he says, Hashem will give you this, which means she didn't ask it from Ailey. And earlier, maybe she relied on Elkanah, but she realizes only Hashem is her, is her power that is going to be able to solve this for her. And finally, if you look at the next page on source number we're still in D, in Pasuk Yutet 19. It tells us, Vayizkereha Hashem. Just like it said with Rachel, Hashem remembers her. Hashem remembers Chana. So the anguish of Rachel is reminded us here with Chana as well. Hashem remembers those who need him. Hashem remembers. Hashem sees. And again, this idea, Zichronot Rosh Hashanah. And she has a child and she calls him Shmuel. And when she goes and she brings him to Shiloh, now I want to go to G. When she brings him to Shiloh and she stands before Ailey, she says, you know, this is the child that I davened, El Hashem. If you look carefully, and the Malbim really emphasizes this, the Malbim says every time she mentions her tefillah and the Tanakh, the Navi, mentions her tefillah, it says El Hashem, Al Hashem, Lifne Hashem. All these words of just feeling right before HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Chana understood and felt this unbelievable feeling of standing before Hashem. And she tells Shmuel, you know, this is the child I daven for. This is that special individual. And Hashem gave me what I asked for. And she calls him Shmuel also because Hashem 
gave me what I asked for, but also because I borrowed him. She understands how Hashem rules the world and owns the world. And even everybody, every person is really part of the creations of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And this is a beautiful concept of Hana, understanding the unbelievable power of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, that maybe she didn't understand so much before, but in her anguish, she saw and she understood that this is an important idea. If you look at Parak Bet, and this is also included in the Haftarah of Rosh Hashanah, her tefillah after Shmuel was born, and we're now in two, in Perek Bet, Pasuk Aleph. Vatit palel chana vatomar alatzli bi b'ashem, ramakar ni b'ashem. She's singing this unbelievable song of shevach v'oda, of praise, thanksgiving, and pouring her heart out to Hashem in praise. Many times we dive into Hashem, but we never thank him afterwards. We do the crying and the davening to Hashem, but then we don't thank him. And even sometimes we don't get what we want, but we have to thank him for listening to us. We have to realize, you know, what's happening in the world. And sometimes other people get great things, but we have to thank Hashem. And what Hannah does is that she also thanks Hashem. And if you understand also, you're thinking, oh yeah, bakasha, sheva, hoda. These are all the parts of Shmon Esrei. Chana is really anticipating what Shmon Esrei is all about. She's putting together all these people. And this is a woman. This is someone that we can all look to as our exemplar. We read her on Rosh Hashanah because she is teaching us something so important. She's saying this unbelievable tefillah. And again, if you look carefully, Alatzli bi Bahashem. In Kadosh Kahashem. She mentions Hashem's name in every single sentence she realizes Koach Hashem. And that is what's so special. I want to do some of the Mepharshim now, which are really fascinating. If you look at number two in Rashi, number two on the source, Rashi brings in a very beautiful Midrash. And Rashi wants to say, where did she get this idea from? Now Elkanah would go every year to bring everyone to Shiloh. Now we all know that the official rule is only the men have to go during the holidays to Shiloh, which meant the Mishkan or to the Beit HaMikdash. But Elkanah made sure to bring his entire family. He felt everybody had to have this close connection to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Not just the people, right? Not just the men, but everybody had to have this opportunity. So he would bring his whole family. And every time he would bring his family, more people would join and come and be part of their group. Let's go to number three, Radak. Radak also explains when we read in the beginning that he would go to the Mishkan, that he would go to the tabernacle, it says, It says to bow down and to bring a sacrifice. Don't you usually just go to the Mishkan just to bring sacrifices? Why say that you're also going to daven there? So there are two views of the Chachamim. One is that davening is equal to korbanot. And we all know that we daven matching the korbanot. There was a korban tamid in the morning shachrit. There was a korban mincha in the afternoon. There also was the burning of the um, korban that went through till mariv. And that's why we also have tefillat ma'ariv. So we know one is for the other. But we also know that there was a tefillah that went along with the korbanot. And we know that Shlomo, when he talks about the Beit HaMikdash, one of the main things he says is this idea of tefillah. Tefillah, according to the Rabbanan, if you look at the second part of Radak, chaviva tefillah yoter mikola korbanot. Tefillah is even more important than korbanot. Sometimes we feel terrible today. We do, right? That we don't have korbanot and we don't have the Beit HaMikdash. And we wonder, is Hashem listening? Is this as good as it could be? Now, of course, we want the Beit HaMikdash to be built and we want the Korbanot to be reinstated and then we can daven and bring Korbanot. But let us not forget how powerful our tfilos are because that's really what Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov established first, the idea of tfilah. And Chana is showing us how powerful tfilah is. So Chachamim say, Chavivat tfilah yoter korbanot. 
Of course, korbanot are so important. It's so important, the avoda in the Beit HaMikdash, but it must come, come along with fila. And fila could be done anywhere, at any time, just you and HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And that's also a very important message for us. The Radak explains, if you look at number four, that idea that we explained and discussed earlier, that what Hannah does beautifully is that she also does shevach v'hoda. She doesn't leave it just that, oh, I beg, I want, and the asking, the bakasha. Tefillah has to be complete. It also has to be shevach, praise and thanksgiving. You can't just leave it, oh, I want, gimme, gimme, gimme. It's really part of this bigger idea, way more filled out and fleshed out and sophisticated and multivalent. The Malbim explains, look at number five. The Malbim says, so what was special about her tefillah? So the Malbim says, number one, she was crying. We're on number five. Tefillah, if it has dma'ot crying, is way more meaningful. Now, you don't need to actually have the tears, but tears usually show a certain emotional response, a certain I'm all in. Now, not everyone cries. So he doesn't mean, oh, you need to have the tears, but you need to have that emotional response that usually brings tears, which means you're all, your body and your mind and your neshama are all in this tefillah. Number two, he says, lishpochet nafsha. You have to pour out your heart. Don't just say the words. You have to pour out your heart. Now, we understand also, we can't do that every day. Every day is not a day that we can really dive in with all our hearts. So many things are going on. But every so often, we have to be able to dig deep, to get down there and realize that we have to make this connection with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. We have to really dig deep and bear our souls to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And that's also what was so special about Hannah's tefillah. In addition, the Malbim says, Hashem levado. She davened only to Hashem, not thinking I need an intermediary. I need Elkanah to daven for me. I need Eli, the Kohen, to daven for me. And again, we ask great Rabbanim to daven for us, to be a Melitz Yosher, but we must never take away our personal responsibility. We always have to be the ones davening also for ourselves if we can. Just like Ishmael was davening for himself. Chana was davening also for herself. And Hashem listens because it's so important to still have that personal responsibility. Anna Neder, we don't advocate this today, but she makes that swear, that Neder right away that she promises she's going to give Shmuel to Hashem, which means she puts her mouth where her, she puts her actions where her mouth is which means she is willing to do what it requires instead of just saying things, but not willing to walk the walk. And that is also what Malbim is saying. So we don't do a neder today, but we have to be all in. We have to be sincere and committed in a complete way. If we say something, we should do it, especially in tefillah, especially in those moments where we really pour our heart out to Hashem. It's not just words that we say. We mean it. It has to really be complete. And the Gemara explains, number six, so beautifully, that where do we learn all the halachot of Shmon Esre? We learn them from Chana. The Gemara explains, where do we learn all the halachot of Shmon Esre? We learn it from Chana. We see that you have to have kavana. She had such kavana. We see that she only moved her lips but didn't use her voice. We saw that she was not drunk. She was very clear headed. We learn all of these things from Chana, which means all the basic halachot of Shema Nesrei, which is the definition of what major tefillah is, right? Because we have Shema, which is a separate Doraita halacha, and we have tefillah, which is Shema Nesrei. Chana is the one who taught us how to do the most major tefillah that we have three times a day. It's Chana. And the Gemara says, we learn it from her. Not only that, if you look at number eight, the Gemara says beautifully that Chana was the one who was a Nevia. This Gemara in Megillah Yudalid is the list that we have of all the Neviot, all the prophetesses. It never says, oh, that Chana is a prophetess. It never says, oh, Chana Nevia. She's never called a Nevia. 
So the Gemara has a Masora and learns it from the Psukim about Chana. So what are the Psukim about Chana? What is learned from Chana and teaches us that she's a Nevia? Look what the Gemara says. Number one, she had a Nevua that she saw that Shmuel is going to anoint Shaul with a flask of oil, a jar, a pitcher, but she's, but David is going to be anointed with a Karen Shemen, a horn of oil. So she has real Nevua hidden in her tefillah. But two other things are very important. The Gemara explains that she understood philosophical ideas about a Kodesh Baruch Hu. She was a great thinker and a great philosopher. Now, we don't expect us all to be great thinkers and great philosophers, but you have to understand if we're davening to a Kodesh Baruch Hu, we have to understand how great he is, because otherwise, why are we davening to Hashem? What makes Hashem Hashem? So we have to have basic ideas of why Hashem is so great. And before we dive in, we have to really internalize that message. And Chana helps us internalize that message. What are the two things that she was eloquent about and really articulated in her tefillah? Number one is that usually when we have children, children usually outlive us. Chas v'shalom, we have situations where not. But usually they do. And definitely our great, 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 great grandchildren down the line live longer than we do. Not Hashem. Hashem is here from the first day of creation, before the world, and he outlives us all to realize how powerful and that Hashem is the Ein Sof, the never-ending. Hannah understood that. Number two, she also understood that Hashem was able to give people their neshamas. Their, Hashem is the one who can make a form and give it a soul, a life. These ideas are so basic to our understanding of the greatness of Hashem. And without that, tefillah is not really meaningful because you have to understand who you're davening to and what makes Hashem so great. And that's also what is so interesting about Hannah. She starts out as this individual, we don't hear her voice, we only hear her crying. Passive, passive, passive. Everything is happening every year. What she teaches us is it's never too late. It's never too late to turn around and make realizations and then change our life or move in a certain direction or understand something. It's so easy and it happens to all of us. Listen, I've been doing this for so many years and this is what I do. This is who I am. But Chara teaches us that also we can look inside and really make something different or better or develop something in our personality that really we weren't using to its utmost before. Let's go to source number 10. In 10, in 9 and 10, I'm going to do both, 9 and 10. Here is the source in the Gemara that we read the Haftara of Chana on Rosh Hashanah. I mentioned many things before. I want you to see all the sources to show where this all comes from. So the Gemara discusses that we read the Haftara of Chana and her tefillah on Rosh Hashanah because, again, this is teaching us how we dig deep, how we connect with the Kaddish Baruch Hu. And number 10 is showing that Bracho says, ah, we have seven brachot on Shabbos. We learned that from David. And we're going to look at David towards the end of the Sheur. David, another individual who wrote to Hilim, who davened so beautifully to Hashem. When we want to daven for someone who's sick and we want to really emphasize the power of Hashem and our reliance on Hashem and our praise of Hashem, we pick Tehillim. It's such a beautiful custom that so many times, all the time, and now I'm on so many WhatsApp groups, right? That we're doing roving Tehillim constantly and that we say it after davening and we say it throughout the day. That's our way of connecting with Hashem. So in one of the Prakim of Tehillim, it says, call Hashem, Seven, seven times. And from that, we learn seven brachot on Amida of Shabbos. Remember, even though we call it Shman Esrei, we only say seven brachot on Shabbos. But on Rosh Hashanah, we know for Musaf, we add Shofarot, Zichronot, and Malchuyot. And on Rosh Hashanah, we say nine different 
Brachot. And what does this Gemara say? We're on number 10. In Masechet Brachot, it says, we say those Brachot because of Chana. So not only do we learn how tefillah is so important, she sets the tone to go over the top with nine brachot in the Musaf of Rosh Hashanah. Again, she is really teaching us tefillah, how important it is. And she got into the regular traditional ideas of what tefillah is all about. How we say Shmona Esrei. What are the brachot that we say in Shmona Esrei? It's really amazing how influential she was. And we're gonna to go to number 12. And number 12 is so interesting. It's the Yalkut Shimoni and the Talmud Bavli. So first it's in the Gemara. I brought the source directly from the Gemara. The Gemara in Brachos, Daf Lamed Aleph Amud Bet, where the story of how we daven, why we daven, and so much about Chana. And this is fascinating to us. Chana pours her heart out to Hashem, as we said. She cries, right? She says, Hashem, remember me. But it doesn't tell us the words she says there. She just says, oh, remember me. And the Gemara fills out the picture of what she said. And this to us is going to be fascinating. Look at A. It tells a story that Hannah is telling this mashal, this parable to Hashem. And she says a very rich king had an unbelievable party and he had wonderful food and all of his friends over. And then some poor person comes in and says, I want to join the party. And all the wealthy people look and say, you don't really belong in this party. But the rich head, the king, sees this individual and says, come close. You could be part of this party. What is Hannah saying? Hashem, you should be like that king. You see, I need a piece of bread. I need children. You have to give it to me. You owe it to me. Like a king who sees someone coming to a party, he can't push the person away. That would be criminal. What is fascinating about this Midrash that the Gemara is telling us, which means Chana is pouring her heart out to Hashem, and we would almost call it chutzpahdik. But she feels so close to Hashem that she feels she could pour out and say what she feels. What the Gemara is telling us that when we are so connected with our Kodesh Baruch when we really feel a certain need, we should not feel any barriers between us and Hashem. And that's so counterintuitive. This is the Kodesh Baruch Hu, the king of the universe. How can I approach him? But this Gemara is saying you can. Feel that you can say to Hashem what you feel. And that's fascinating. The Gemara has this medrash. Let's go on. Her next, the next medrash is saying, we're still in A, that what is she saying? She's saying, you know what? I'm gonna become a wife that will need to drink the soda water. And we all know that if you drink the soda water and you're really not guilty, then you get pregnant. So she's threatening Hashem. She says, if you don't give me this child, I'm gonna do this thing, because I know according to the halacha, it's gonna force your hand to do this. When we read this, we're shocked. But the Gemara is telling us by these stories that Hannah felt empowered, not chutzpahdik in a negative way, but really beseeching that Hashem is all powerful and that she can feel that she could speak to HaKadosh Baruch Hu and pour out her heart. That's what it wants to say. What's pouring out your heart? Being honest, saying what you feel. Now, we know how difficult that is. You have to be on a certain level to do that, but not on a level, oh, you have to be a hush of person. You have to be from an important family. You have to be internally on a level. Everyone can do it. Hannah, who was so removed from this, was able to get to that point. What's B? B, again, the Gemara continues. It's giving another scenario, saying that she's saying, I'm doing my part of being a Jewish woman. I do nida, I do chala, I separate hafrashas chala, I do nida, I go to the mikvah, I light Shabbos candles, I'm doing my part. Now you have to do your part. Which means, again, so fascinating that the Gemara is saying that this is what she said. Remember, there's a medrash, so it's not in the psukim. We read all the psukim. But what it wants to say is that we should feel that we can have this connection. Now, again, of course, this is a Baruch we have to be respectful. 
but the message that this Medrash is saying that we should feel that we can pour out our hearts to Hashem. If we feel too inhi inhibited, then we're not davening. We're not really pouring our heart out to Hashem. Just like when we do vidui on Yom Kippur, or when we have to do tshuva, if we're not honest with our Kodesh Baruch Hu, it's not real tshuva. You have to be able to be honest and pour your heart out. Also in all different areas of davening, that's what it's about. Now, again, as we said earlier, we know we can't get to this moment every day in our lives, but every so often we have to feel this passion, this connection, this, you know, road that's open between us and Hashem. Let's go to number C. What is C saying? C is saying that, what is she doing? She's davening to Hashem. And she says, you didn't create anything extra in a person. So if I have a womb and I have breasts, it's in order to serve and to have a child. Which means you can't have anything in this world that isn't for a reason. And in the end, D says, Vatitpalel al Hashem, melamed sheheticha dvarim klape mala. What does it mean, heticha? She's flinging things towards Hashem, davening strongly. Fascinating. The Gemara is telling us in all these examples that when we are davening to Hashem and pouring out our, our, out our hearts, we really can pour out our hearts to Hashem, to be honest, direct, to feel Hashem's presence. And this does not take away from our covered for our Kodesh Baruch Hu, because the people that we respect the most, and of course the Kodesh Baruch Hu that we respect the most, those are the people that we can feel honest the most with and be ourselves the most with. The most with. And I think that's something that we have to remember with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And I want to just continue with others in Tanakh, just to show the wide range. I focused on Chana because she teaches us so many important lessons. But when you look at number 13 in Breshit with Yitzchak, you see that Yitzchak also, when it came to children, they were barren. He's pouring out his heart opposite his wife because she was barren. And Hashem listens and Rivka gave birth. But they went through a lot of suffering. And finally, he's pouring out his heart, beseeching, beseeching. And finally, Hashem listens, which means this idea of beseeching Hashem starts very early. We already have it with Yitzchak in Pshat, in Tanakh. Let's go to number 14. We know beautifully how Moshe davens for Bnei Israel at the Egel, and when Bnei Israel are in trouble. But Moshe also davened beautifully for his sister, Kel Na Refanala, when she had Sarat. And sometimes an unbelievable tefillah could be short. Right? Moshe didn't want to say, oh, that Moshe didn't want people to say, look, for Bnei Israel, he did a long tefillah, but for a sister, he's also doing such a long tefillah. So one view is he did such a short tefillah because maybe sometimes you just say have to say a few words and that hits the nail on the head. It doesn't always have to be so long. Boom, you're connected with HaKadosh Baruch Hu, you say that tefillah. But also, he didn't want people to think I care about my family, but I don't care so much about the community. So he did a shorter tefillah. But we see how passionate and how connected Moshe was with his sister. Kelna, Rifanala, please Hashem, please. Heal her. You can hear the beseeching of a Kodesh Baruch Hu, how Moshe is davening. And Moshe, we know, is such a great intellectual. He is the one who gave us the Torah, the greatest mind who ever lived. Rambam says there'll never be anyone like Moshe, and that's where the Torah can never be given again. And that's why Torah's Moshe is unique. Someone where we hear the passion and the connection, and sometimes it could be short. We see with Davida Melech, when he is saying his Tehillim, and again, as I said earlier, Tehillim is a vehicle for us. We see and we know from Tefillah that Tefillah is the Oraita in eight Tzara, when you're in trouble. And the big debate between Ramban and Rambam. Here in Tehillim, we see, Shira ma'alot el Hashem batzaratali karati vayaneni. We always dive into Hashem when it's difficult for us. And Hashem will always answer us. We might not always get the answer that we want, that we expect, but Hashem will always answer us. Hashem is always listening. 
And Shira Malot Mima Makim. That is such a beautiful perak. All the perakim are amazing. From the depths, I'm crying out to Hashem. And Hashem, listen to my tachanunim. If you remember all my sins, of course I can't stand before you. And I'm always yearning to Hashem. Kiviti. I'm always yearning to Hashem. And I'm always waiting for your words. And I am waiting at all times because Hashem also has compassion and pidut, which means we always have to realize that Hashem redeems us and Hashem cares about us. And not to forget that. And always to remember that idea of compassion of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. But I brought number 17 because in addition to crying out to Hashem, have mercy on us, we also have to thank Hashem. Mizmor toda. We have to thank Hashem, not only ask for things that Hashem should save us. Yes, we have to ask for that, but we also have to thank Hashem, just like we saw with Chana. And remember, Chana is before David Melech. We have to beseech Hashem, but we also have to thank Hashem. It's a double-edged sword. It's both. It's two sides of the same coin. When we daven, right, we have Shevach, Bakasha, and Hoda. That's what Shmon Esrei is about. All these pieces put together. And that's really the essence of tefillah. And I wanted to bring one of the last Sfarim in Tanakh, because this, this Shi'ur, so I brought from Breshit, and now we're ending with Nehemiah, one of the last Sfarim in Tanakh, that what is Nehemiah saying? Nehemiah is saying, but you with your rachamim, you never left us, and you always keep the Brit with us, and you're always going to be our great connector and our great God. And not only for the whole world, but for us, Am Yisrael. And I think that's very important. No matter who we are or what we are, Hashem is always with us. Hashem said to the world, I'm never going to bring another flood. And he makes a covenant with the world that I'm never going to bring another flood. And that is the rainbow with Noah. But for Am Yisrael, we have that added special brit of chesed, of compassion that Hashem had with Avram Avinu. And sometimes, right, it's difficult, but most of the time we are the special children of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and we have this special relationship. And we should always feel that we can tap into that, that we have this one-on-one -on -one relationship in addition to the communal, unbelievable brit that Hashem made with Am Yisrael. We also have this beautiful connection, the communal, the national, but also the personal. And Chana represents for us that beautiful idea of this personal connection and what tefillah can do for us and how we should see tefillah as an avenue of coming closer to Hashem, of asking and praising, recognizing, as we said, Chana through her tefillah is recognizing the greatness of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and also realizing what does it mean to be in a relationship with HaKadosh Baruch Hu and to really have those lines of communication open. So I wanna wish everyone, right? We finished with Har Sinai, we finished with Shavuot, but we still are on our way to Elul, the three weeks of course, Elul and Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. During this time, we still should galvanize for our tefillot, for our prayers, for our community, for our family, for individuals, for ourselves, for the world and realize that our power of tefillah is very strong and we just have to look for it inside. Thank you. Thank you so much. Does anyone have any questions? You can either unmute yourself or put on the chat. Well, if we've got no questions, I want to thank you so much for such a passionate, powerful, meaningful analysis of prayer and helping us internalize the importance of pouring our heart out to Hashem in order to connect to him. We want to thank you on behalf of both Neostral and Riley Close Shawls, and we look forward to welcoming you to London uh, sometime in the, in the near future. Next Sunday evening, Rabbi Zobin will be giving the share. I want to thank everyone for joining us. Look forward to seeing you next Sunday evening. And um, thank you. Yeah, no, it was a pleasure for me. Uh, you know, at least we 
only you know saw each other or heard each other this way through zoom but we're hoping you know maybe to see each other in person in one way or the other but if not this was really a wonderful wonderful uh opportunity and just hatzlacha and everything that you do and everyone should stay well and healthy and you know our tefillot should really heal the world amen thank you and you'll see on the chat the thanks coming through to you yeah, thank you so much it was really my pleasure and you know we should just be able to learn together you know many other times and just to really uh, enjoy Dvar Hashem which is really so beautiful and to see how it really relates to our lives in a very meaningful way Amen. thank you thank you thank you so much so we should always share Besorot Tovot Amen. Take care.